Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. We are excited to have Dr. William Seeds and Dr. James Laval share new information about the emerging science of peptide therapy, which they will be presenting at December 13th at our World Congress in Las Vegas. Now I would like to introduce our faculty before they begin tonight's webinar. Dr. Seeds is a leading edge re researcher, innovative educator, and Ohio native, practicing top orthopedic care. Dr. Seeds provides orthopedic care for the world-renowned Spire Institute, Olympic Training Center in Geneva, Ohio. He has treated athletes from all over the world, helping them compete on the playing field and fulfill their dreams of winning gold medals. He consults for Dancing with the Stars, enabling their dancers to stay competitive and recapture their injuries, their careers after injury. Dr. Seeds is the director of the Ohio Bone and Joint Institute for University Hospitals and is a site director for the Residency Richmond Program. Dr. Seeds believes that genuine human interaction and detailed involvement during the phases of treatment are what maximizes the patient's ability to get healthy and remain healthy. James Laval is a nationally recognized clinical pharmacist, author, educator, industry consultant, and clinical pioneer in the field of natural therapeutics. One of the nation's top influencers in legitimizing integrative medicine, Laval trains thousands of physicians and other healthcare professionals each year on the application of natural therapies in their contemporary practices. He was named one of the 50 most influential pharmacists by American Druggist Magazine and the 2011 Clinician of the Year by the Natural Products Association. Laval founded Metabolic Code Enterprises Incorporated to develop and launch his proprietary metabolic assessment platform for practitioners. Laval is also the author of more than 20 books and ebooks, including his most recently released publication, Your Blood Never Lies, as well as his bestseller, Cracking the Melabotic Code and Nat Nutritional Cost of Drugs. Should you have any questions, please submit them using the chat option and we will address questions at the end of the webinar. Doctors, I will now hand the webinar over to you. Great, thank you. Uh, I'm going to just start with a little bit of an introduction, and then you know we're going to let the expert, uh, Dr. Seeds, kind of uh, take off on a nice introduction to peptides. You know, the first thing is is what you're going to learn at this uh, peptide conference. It's really about clinical application, and when I say clinical application, it's one thing when you read the research about peptides because you know it's an, obviously it's an emerging field. Everybody's jumping on board. But what I found, it's a bit of a black box. I mean, um, people aren't necessarily, you know, using them with the best clinical utility. Uh, when I met, you know, Dr. Seed several years ago, he's devoted, you know, the last decade of his life to just that situation where it's clinical application. What works for how long? How do you pulse it? What's going to burn out the growth hormone receptors? What's not? It's these clinical insights and pearls for how you apply peptides that really make the difference as to how effective they're going to be for you in practice. I know I've been utilizing them in my practice. I've been getting stellar results. The other piece to, the, to this uh, conference that you're going to get is what are the nutritional applications? Um, what do you use to augment peptide therapy to maximize uh, mitochondrial regeneration and resuscitation? anabolic drive in the individual to reduce sarcopenia, how to maximize uh, your own innate growth hormone response. So there's the, the second component to this course, which nobody else is really teaching, to be honest with you, is what are the nutritional defaults that you need to look for and how to kind of look at it from a systems biology approach. Uh, I think you'll find the day uh, will be you know, stimulating and exciting and there's a lot of new information while it will be on the format of what we presented last year, there's changes, there's uh, some sharpening of that pencil to really give you guys some even greater pointers. I know a lot of people came out of there with a ton of value, uh, but we're going to even give that value even at a higher level with this year's because we got our first one under the belt and we had such a great response and an overwhelming amount of people responding uh, you know, to us that we you know, we're, we're going to just, you know, we're going to take it, we're going to elevate the game. Uh, and, and then just to keep in mind, we will be, it's, it, we're, we're planning on working with A4M and MMI to attempt to develop a peptide uh, full symposium and fellowship. So keep posted on that. 
I'm going to let Dr. Seeds take off from this point. I'm going to add a little bit of color commentary during the course of the hour where it's appropriate if uh, Dr. Seeds asks me an opinion. Uh, and then I'll, we'll end together with a discussion of a very appropriate case study of the kind of person that we know you see every day. Uh, so we'll end with a little bit of discussion on case study. Just keep in mind that during the uh, course, while in Vegas, we will go over some case studies. We'll have labs, we'll have real life examples that we're gonna be going through. So uh, Phil, if you wanna take it over from there, uh, there you go. Jim, thank you and uh, thank you for the introduction. I I want to uh, want to express the uh, gratitude I have to just all the, the docs who reached out to me and Jim uh, from our last course and who, who have stayed yeah. in touch with us with uh, with helping them kind of sort through some of the initial decision making and and processes in integrating this in, into their practice and we've been it's been so gratifying to hear the the, um, the incredible stories that uh, we've been getting from the, uh, these individuals who've been utilizing them in their practice and the, the changes um, that they've been able to uh, see in their patients and, and, and the, the, the immediate, you know, the, that process of where they've been working with those difficult patients and they've been able to bring something a little different to the table to to help them kind of get the, the the process of of the patient in the right mindset of of, of accepting a process that's uh, uh, that can change uh, some of the aspects of 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 their treatment protocols that can change things right away and what I mean is some of the well-being aspects of getting the patient feeling a little bit better right off the bat with this process has been, I, I think, a game changer for most people. And uh, that's been the, the resounding uh, uh, feedback that, uh, that Jim and I have been, been able to participate in and, and hearing how we have been able to, to help these people, you know, utilize these things right away. And, and that's a that's been fantastic, and we've loved the stories and and, and helping them uh, progress with with their treatment plan, their treatment plans. And and I think as Jim noted, this you know we have the the one course uh, that we completed, and I think we I think we did a a great job in getting the message out there and what we what we felt was important. And this coming uh, discussion that we're uh, and, and workshop that we're going to have in, in Vegas. I think is going to be uh, a, a little different, and it's going to it's going to meet a little bit more of the uh, input that we got from the audience. Um, that it, it's it's definitely going to be more, um, I think even more powerful than what we we're, were able to present in Florida, and uh, I'm I'm really looking forward to that. So so thanks, Jim, and I think that what I'd like to do is just run through some slides quickly of of kind of a perspective, I want to give you a perspective of how we're looking at the use of uh, peptides and, and how it may fit into the realm of your thinking as you start thinking about, uh, you know, the, the process of what you've learned through A4M or through the uh, Metabolic follow, uh, Fellowship, uh, Nutritional Fellowship, the things that you've learned and, and how you can utilize this thought process and what what we bring to the table with uh, the information of what peptides are their their power and their uh, their use in uh, in in what we see uh, gaining a, a lot of ground here uh, in in taking care of your patients. So I'll just get right into it and we'll just start the process and then uh, Jim will interject here and there and we'll we'll try to. Just give you a little bit of an overview of of what we're going to be talking about, um, and uh, and go from there. So let's see if I can get we get us going here. Okay. Okay. Why is that not working? There we go. So when 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 we look at the aging process, uh, you know, it, I, I kind of look at aging as it, it can be viewed as a disease process. And um, 
and as this applies to aging, this applies to injury, um, it, it's kind of the same, we're looking at all, kind of the same processes that go through through any um, insult to the body. And as I'm kind of using aging as the uh, as a general term here, and and but I look at it as a, a disease process. And when I look at it, I look at it as uh, increased oxidative state as we age. You know, all the the, the free radicals and reactive oxygen species that are created as we age and the catabolism that's created as we age. And these are some of the same fundamental things that we see in disease processes. Um, so in a catabolic state, we see increased disease states, as, as I discussed. We, we see a decreased immune function. We see decreased pH. We see a increased demineralization of bone. We see increased sarcopenia. Uh, we see a, a decrease uh, nutrient acquisition, you know, loss of appetite, loss of energy, loss of sleep, loss of, we see an increased sedentary lifestyle and depression. So we, we kind of see this, I'm trying to just kind of create a picture of, of this process that happens not just with aging, but can happen with any disease process as it progresses um, in a uh, in a uh, delayed or uh, uh, slow onset process. Um, oops, I went the wrong way there. So, or in the oxidative state, we look at, uh, when we when we're looking at this, we're looking at increased reactive oxygen species, that's, which is, you know, some people refer to this as the theory of aging. This is why we have, uh, we age because of this increased process of uh, superoxides and reactive oxygen species that are being created uh, that cause damage to DNA, uh, the mitochondria, the transcription factors, that they just cause disruption. And there is that theory that this is why um, the cell breaks down and, and we have this aging process. Um, I, I am of the opinion that this is part of that, but I, I think there's actually probably more to that than, than just uh, reactive oxygen species, but I think they play a, a significant role, in, and I'll be talking more about that. Uh, we have loss of redox, and uh, we have uh, mitochondrial dysfunction, which which I'm going to talk a little bit more about here as far as the, you know, this is kind of where we see this mitochondrial dysfunction occurring is because of these reactive oxygen species that occur in that electron transport chain. And um, we'll talk a little bit more as we go through that here. So the mitochondrial dysfunction, we see a decrease in mitochondrial with aging. We see a decrease in mitochondrial biogenesis. We see abnormal abilities of the uh, the ability of the mitochondria to go through its process of fission or fusion uh, as it's trying to either um, go through that that biogenic phase or if it's trying to get rid of uh, bad material within the mitochondria, it loses that ability to go through that process. We have a loss of electron transport chain proteins and enzymes. We have a decreased uh, production of uh, stex. Uh, sex steroids, um, and, and probably, I mean, you could, you know, that's that could be, uh, we we could extrapolate that or even further because that's where the uh, pregnenolone is is, uh, you know, cholesterol comes through the uh, the membrane there and is into the inner membrane where it's produced, where pregnenolone is produced. So pregnenolone is that. Is that that's kind of that rate limiting step right there in the mitochondria that can go all the way over to any one of the sex steroid hormones or uh, or cortisol, um, uh, and and that is that's something that that I, I think we lose sight of also that the mitochondria has control of that. Um, you have a decrease in growth and in inflammation, um, immune transcription factors. We have decreased apoptosis of the cell, and you've got decreased stem cell activation. When all of these, when you look at all these, kind of from a, a general standpoint, that's, that's a significant amount of uh, processes that are occurring as we age with, as the mitochondria, uh, as we 
see dysfunction in the mitochondria, which leads to, which we have many theories and, and discussions on how this leads to chronic diseases. And in the same fashion, uh, as I've shown here, uh, this is what happens as we age. And it's really how, you know, what happens, how does the body respond to these processes? Um, so dysfunction leads to stressors such as, you know, allostatic load, which is a, a significant uh, part of what kind of slowly builds that the body faces on a daily basis. Uh, and these are stressors that the body has to adapt to. And as we lose adaption to these stressors, it becomes harder for the mitochondria to function in the fashion that we're that that we've been accustomed to in in dealing with these stressors and that's where we kind of start to see these processes break down and we have loss of uh, uh, homeostasis of the cell and we have then progressively with all these things you know we have loss of the circadian rhythm so we have a lot of things occurring at once um, when we're not able to adapt and and I think um, you know, our, our case presentation will be a good example of that, of, uh, of, LS, of the allostatic load build and, and how the body can lose the ability to adapt. And, and I, you know, it's my belief that, in my opinion, that the mitochondria plays a significant part of this. Um, and so in aging, taking this a step further, we have a decrease in uh, growth hormone release. So we have increased sarcopenia, we have a decreased oxidative capacity, we have increase in abdominal fat, and as we reach you know, 30 years of age, we start to lose that, that, that pulsing, or that, uh, uh, the amount of growth hormone that we would typically s secrete. It's about 15% every 10 years, and at uh, 55, you're about 16% of what you were producing at your highest point of puberty. That's a significant loss of growth hormone produced. And with that, you also see a decrease in downstream of IGF-1 production. So why is that relevant? Well, how do we keep the mitochondria optimal and en enhanced in, in, in optimal and also enhancing the immune system because the mitochondria has a significant influence on on the immune system also and as we age uh, the immune system is affected as we, when we're injured the immune system is affected and with chronic disease processes the immune system is not functioning at an optimal level so growth hormone has an issue I believe in all of these processes and in and in optimization of the mitochondria. So do we replace growth hormone exogenously? Well, exogenous growth hormone can lead to increased lean body mass, decreased fat mass, it can improve oxidative phosphorylation, it can increase protein synthesis. So it, you know, from a standpoint of what does growth hormone do if we, if we exogenously uh, 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 infuse uh, growth hormone it can have it can have some significant profound effects, but the problem with growth hormone, uh, besides the fact that it's illegal to use, it's uh, it, other than uh, if you meet certain criteria for uh, for true uh, loss of growth hormone pr production, it can't be used in an anti-aging uh, from an anti-aging standpoint. It can't be used for uh, injury standpoint. It's it's actually a, a law federal law now that prevents us from using it and but it's it's not really a, a bad problem because the growth hormone uh, the issues with growth hormone that you worry about are the fact that it leads to insulin resistance cardiomegaly immune dysfunction malignant transformations acromegaly and increased organ growth well why do we see some of these things it's because growth hormone I, I think that the issue that people aren't aware of or don't keep uh, uh, aren't focused on is the fact that when you give that exogenously growth hormone is just it constantly bleeds it meaning it's it's a constant 
stimulus. It's typically in the brain when you release growth hormone, you release it by pulsing it. And you pulse it maybe eight to nine times uh, within a 24 hour period. So it's pulsed out of the uh, anterior pituitary and, and that's it. With exogenous growth hormone, it's it's constantly there and it's constantly working on the growth hormone receptors, not uh, in practically everywhere in the body. And so you can see, if if you look at something like that, you could see how this could have a significant downside over time if it's constantly stimulating a receptor. Um, and that's where, in the course, when we go through this, we go into a lot of these things in significant detail and because I think it's very important for you once you have the understanding of of what how important these receptors are and, and specifically the effect that growth hormone can have not just on the body but on the brain, you start to realize that, wow, there are some significant effects in, in in utilizing something exogenously like this and and what what's really interesting is what happens at the level of the mitochondria and that there is a with constant receptor activation there is a breakdown of the electron transport chain of the mitochondria and but it, it and, and there's an increase in actually reactive oxygen species that are produced but it also, the growth hormone works in another way that it also keeps the mitochondria working. It doesn't make it completely dysfunctional, but it certainly doesn't make it functional and optimized and get it back to that homeostatic state of, you know, what we're really trying to, to accomplish with or what we'd like to see with the, with the release of growth hormone. And, and I think that's a really important point to, if you're going to, uh, look at something like this um, in, in in what you know I, I think we've had the right um, ideas of of like what I've tried to present here that you know gosh we we lose something that's very valuable over time as we age it it absolutely has a significant effect on the body and specifically the mitochondria um, and more so and also um, the muscle um, which we'll talk about a little bit more here, but the the fact that it 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 goes through this constant bleed is is a very important thing that uh, that you need to realize that actually has some significant negative aspects of um, of creating all these other problems. Um, so when we so when we look at this, we're if we could do something that's more physiologic, that might be an answer to getting this growth hormone released and also uh, helping us get the cell or, uh, more in a homeostatic pattern or, or getting that mitochondria to function optimally if we know already, and that's what I've tried to discuss here very quickly, is that, it, that as we lose growth hormone, we have these processes that occur with dysfunction of the mitochondria, which lead to dysfunction of the cell, which lead to problems such as insulin resistance or the insulin, you know, the the receptors um, and so forth. I mean, it, it, we could go into each disease process and, and talk about this, but and that's kind of what we do in the course. To we we do an overview of that, but so. If we have something like potentially a peptide that could stimulate the release of growth hormone in a physiologic manner, that would be optimal. And it's your body creating its specific growth hormone, not a synthetic, but what your body makes. And it's uh, it's that process um, that we look at utilizing some of these peptides that we're just initially talking about here today in its effect on uh, the release of growth hormone and the downstream effects of that. Um, and not just its release of growth hormone from the anterior uh, pituitary, but it also these peptides that we're specifically talking about here today, their, their actual effect on uh, numerous other uh, organs and cells in the body that have these receptors for these peptides, which is just fascinating to uh, once you 
uh, start to see some of the uh, information of you know what these individual receptors do also at the cell level so you've not only got the growth hormone you're releasing to do its job in a physiological manner and to bring you back to potentially you know where the where the cell was functioning uh, at its um, at its typical uh, at its normal uh, function um, you've also got a, a way to activate the cell uh, to continue to um, keep other aspects of the cell uh, functioning and and that's that's what we talk about in great detail in the course um, and we'll we'll go through a little bit of that here but so when we talk about uh, specifically uh, growth hormone releasing hormone uh, which is one of the peptides it's a it's a pleiotropic peptide meaning it has multiple ways of working not just the GH release but also there are peripheral receptors on many cells in the body so growth hormone releasing hormone will cause that that uh, physiological release of growth hormone and then it has its downstream effects of IGF-1 uh, meaning uh, IGF-1 is just as important or as, is an important aspect of the downstream effect of, of uh, growth hormone um, and, and I brought up the point about sarcopenia you know that that's a big issue as we age uh, unfortunately we lose muscle mass well muscle mass has a great influence on um, on the uptake of glucose and the use of insulin because that's you know muscles muscles are are, are more uh, are the specific are, are mainly the specific site of where we see some of these issues with insulin resistance and and other aspects of mild kind production which we talk about but um, if we start losing muscle mass we start losing a lot of other important factors uh, in, in maintaining our health well and we know Bill, that growth yes yeah it, it, could you just would you just basically say that sarcopenia I mean muscle mass retention is the currency of aging period it's metabolic currency You're, that's what, it's, yeah, it metabolic is the metabolic currency, currency of agency and, and then would you say that because I see you have these inflammatory cytokines listed this is a modulating type of therapy, right? Where it's where it's kind of giving your body what it what it needs in order to regulate, because it's hitting these receptors that are you know crying for as we're aging, crying to get stimulated again. So this is really you could almost say immunomodulating in its effect. Is that correct? Absolutely, and 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 it's in train it's in training these receptors again. I mean that that's the kind of interesting thing that. You're you're upregulating. It's like they. It's almost like they go to sleep in some some of these receptors. But but absolutely. And 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 just to take you know to to what's important is in muscle is that's where a lot of your muscle, a lot of your IGF one is produced in muscle, and your androgen receptors are also produced in muscle. But they only can be produced if growth hormone stimulates what's called the STAT five AB receptor. In muscle and then that process that occurs in the cell of transcription factors that actually make the IGF-1 and make these androgen receptors which you need for to maintain your muscle mass um, so it, it, it's and, and then from there um, as we'll talk about in the course um, you know you can almost consider I mean muscles almost like a, I consider it another endocrine um, uh, organ because of the myokine you know production and and what we know now uh, what those uh, end products do for the brain and the rest of the body which which is I, I think all very fascinating but yeah I, I agree with you hundred percent on that Jim um, so uh, so as I said we, we we see peripheral binding directly of these GHRH receptors um, and uh, because these are these are what you produce um, these are more clinically so the clinical applications of this are I, I think are are huge um, because we're utilizing your designed your genetically designed growth hormone uh, to work on these 
on its receptors um, just basically by pulsing this out of the anterior pituitary. And then, you know, as I say here in the slide, the reparative functions of the GHRH agonists are, uh, have also down regulation inflammatory cytokines, including the interleukin-2, interleukin-6, and 10. And, and we get into more of that immune modulation, but um, I think that's another important thing to realize that you know, as we age, we get thymic involution, we, we lose the, the thymus. And that's really relevant when we talk about T cells, B cells, and, uh, um, and the, the immune functions that we lose as we age. Well, what if I, you know, what if I interjected that we were looking now where we're seeing the ability to actively uh, rejuvenate the thymus and and it, that we realize that these T cells and B cells um, uh, have and monocytes, et cetera, have GHRH receptors. Um, that's that's actually fascinating, and that these these immune cells actually produce their own GHR. Uh, they they produce their own GHRPs, uh, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, that are used for crosstalk between the immune cells and actually stimulate the brain itself to release um, uh, growth hormone through GHRH release. I mean, that's that's pretty fascinating when when you think about how this crosstalk actually s goes down to the cellular level, and and that's what we talk about um, also in the course uh, uh, in in Vegas. So. Again, it's hard to put this all together in an hour, but I just want to get your mind stimulated to start thinking about, wow, you know, there's, there's quite a bit here when you think of the capability of what you can do just with a single pulse of what's genetically designed to work for you. And so when we talk about the growth hormone releasing hormones, we're talking about the sermorellins, uh, growth hormone releasing factor one, uh, modified one, uh, 29, and then we can talk about what's CJC 129, uh, 1296, and that's with a, uh, a drug affinity complex that actually keeps its uh, half-life a little longer in the blood, and then tezomorelin. Um, these are just some of the ones we talk about. And this just shows you um, some of the extra pituitary uh, signaling uh, 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 receptors that are in these organs specifically where GHRH has uh, other effects and we talk about these individually and uh, uh, I, I think the brain uh, is a whole nother uh, could could we could spend a day on that just with these peptides and, and other peptides but uh, we talk about that quite a bit about memory and short-term memory and long-term memory etc and depression anxiety and so forth so GHRH is influenced uh, systemically, endocrine, uh, regulation of growth hormone and release. Locally, it's got autocrine and paracrine factors. It's involved in wound healing and fibroblast proliferation and migration. In the myocardi myocardium, it's involved with survival proliferation differentiation because there are GHRH receptors in the myocardial cells. The pancreatic cells, uh, it, we see that they have GHRH receptors that are involved in proliferation and survival. Um, we have the immune system, which we talked about, regulation of cytokine production and differentiation and reproductive, uh, and then uh, uh, involved in placenta. And then on the other side of it, it's we also know about GH, GH, GHRH influence with uh, cancer growth also. So then there's the other side of this, which is the growth hormone releasing peptide. And the reason I bring these up together is because the growth hormone releasing hormone is what releases growth hormone from the anterior pituitary. The growth hormone releasing peptide kind of works synergistically with the growth hormone releasing hormone. And what it does basically is it, it acts to inhibit somatostatin. And somatostatin is something that your hypothalamus produces to inhibit release of growth hormone, basically. It's a constant inhibitory effect on the anterior pituitary not to release growth hormone. So where these 
growth hormone releasing peptides come into play is they counteract that activity of the somatostatin. They also have an added effect on releasing growth hormone, releasing hormone from the hypothalamus itself. So what they can do potentially is increase that pulse of not only release the growth hormone, but they can increase that pulse that you're trying to create. So you can push out a little bit more growth hormone than you typically might be able to. And that, that's, that's kind of a, that, that's a nice synergistic uh, aspect of using uh, GHRH with a GHRP. Um, and most of all of our, a lot of the research with the GHRPs have been kind of based off of ghrelin, um, which is a GHRP, which is produced in the uh, GI tract. And um, so when we talk about GHRPs, we're, we're basically talking about ghrelin, ghrelin mimics. And that's your GHRP2s, your GHRP6, your ipamorelin and hexamorelin are just a few of the ones that we discuss in the course. And, and how to utilize. So when you look at this uh, in, in, a, in, in trying to look at all the, the, these aspects of how they work together, um, as I discussed, the GHRP antagonizes the somatin statin release and it thereby release the GHR um, uh, H will release the growth hormone. Uh, from the anterior pituitary, and you can kind of see that with the uh, how this interacts from um, from the uh, uh, slide that I show you here, and and actually you can you can see how where the ghrelin is its effect. I can't move my arrow here. There we go. Uh, it, how the ghrelin, which is a GHRP, and how it affects this release. Uh, directly from the hypothalamus of the GHRH, but how it also inhibits uh, somatostatin. So it's it's kind of interesting to it, once you kind of understand this mechanism, uh, you can do some things in utilizing these together. And specifically, uh, we get into the use of these, um, you know, the timing factors and and other things that you have to be aware of where diet and Jim will talk a little bit about this, uh, but how diet can actually profoundly affect the use of these. And um, as far as carbohydrates, proteins, and fatty acids, you got to be aware of what you're eating at specific times to utilize specifically when you're when you're trying to uh, influence the release of growth hormone. You you, ne you need to understand that mechanism. Um, so this is uh, so GHRP receptors are also another fascinating part of. Not only do they have an effect in the brain in the release, uh, you know, inhibiting somatostatin and releasing GHRH and increasing that pulse and release, but they also have profound effects on the body where their GHRP receptors also. So we see, you know, their their effects on the stomach, the heart, um, the sympathetic nervous system, uh, the brain, and uh, pancreas, liver, and, and fat. So. Again, profound um, effects not only on the hypothalamus and the pituitary, but also on the rest of the body. And once you kind of get an idea of the use of how you can utilize that, um, there are things that we know that some of these GHR, you know, like we know ghrelin, right? Ghrelin as a GHRP2 or a GHRP6 will have some of the ghrelin effects of increasing appetite. So um, that's one thing that we know that the body produces ghrelin, uh, has an effect in the brain on increasing appetite. So it, it's one of these things that we can utilize where in, in say an aging person who's sarcopenic, who you know has lost their appetite, has lost their energy, you're doing things to kind of get them back on track. and one of those capabilities, or one of the utilizations of the GHRP2s is you can help increase their appetite um, by using that in conjunction with your GHRH. And, you know, that's, that's kind of how you start looking at this. You're trying to improve their sleep. You're trying to improve their, uh, their diet and their ability to want to eat. And by doing that, you're increasing their, you know, 
their nutrient acquisition and you're helping to improve building up their amino acid pools and thereby increasing their muscle protein synthesis, increasing their oxidative capacity of the muscle. And so you're starting to get all of those things to start to work in your favor of getting somebody back to where they're feeling a little better about themselves and uh, and they're able to actually do more during the day and so forth. So then real quickly, I'm going to just talk about BPC-157, which is another interesting uh, peptide that we talk about. Uh, that it's a it's a body protection compound. That's BPC, what it stands for, and it uh, it's uh, it, it's really an amazing uh, peptide that um, has some amazing healing properties that uh, uh, we we've been able to uh, uh, utilize and 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 uh, interact with and. It's a it's a peptide fragment of 15 amino acids. It's isolated from gastric juice, the the original uh, uh, body compound peptide, and this is a synthetic sequence peptide of 15 amino acids. And it it's a stable peptide that actually um, can be dissolved in water and given orally, or it can be administered sub Q, or it can be given intranasally. Um, it's very resistant to hydrolysis and enzyme digestion. And the influence of BPC-157 is incredible as far as where the, the uh, multiple areas that it influences as far as tendon repair, muscle repair, intestinal repair, bone, teeth, brain, cornea. And what I really, what, what really intrigued me was its um, actual um, ability to, to upregulate growth hormone receptors. And, and I think that's a very significant, uh, one of the more significant factors. I, I like uh, the utilization of BPC-157. Uh, it's a significant anti-inflammatory modulating effects. It promotes tissue healing, signaling pathways. It regulates gene transcription, influencing these healing factors. And it has, but it has no primary effect itself. It's all about signaling other pathways. Uh, and it can modulate angiogenesis in muscle and tendon healing. It can promote, or it can protect endothelium. It influences the nitric oxide system, which is very important. Um, and its response to vessel injury stimulates gene expression through the uh, EGR1 and uh, NEB2. And I thought uh, this is just an interesting, uh, just a, a real interesting demonstration of how significant BPC-157 can be in muscle injury. And here on the left-hand side is a muscle that's been injured. And uh, this is 14 days after injury uh, where also uh, a steroid has been utilized uh, and, and in the muscle. So it's just showing kind of the, uh, the beginning of some of the chronic inflammatory effects on the left-hand side. And what you're seeing on the right-hand side is 14 days later, the damaged muscle, which looks pretty much normal, uh, when steroid has been utilized. So you're kind of, you get the benefits of a steroid, let's say, with the acute inflammatory aspect, and then the BPC-157 will take away those chronic inflammatory uh, cytokines and, and uh, reactants that are involved in in the, some of the things you don't want with steroids when you use them on muscles or tendons. So it's a pretty powerful uh, tool in my mind uh, with soft tissue injury uh, when you can utilize, when you can see the effects of it here uh, on, on how it can change just the, some of the uh, uh, typical nuances that we do not like uh, with steroids. Um, so um, that was just a quick discussion of BPC-157. Uh, we talked quite a bit about it, and uh, I think its utilization is, uh, uh, is amazing um, if you know how to use it correctly and when to use it. Um, it's, uh, and presently, right now, it's not a, it's not a WADA uh, controlled uh, peptide, which is interesting also. I think it's more because they can't, because nothing can be pinned down to its exact mechanism. But, but it's truly, a, I think, more of a healing peptide. Um, 
and then I, I just kind of went through some of these things, Jim. As Jim stated, we're really fortunate to be able to go take some of these next steps and uh, bringing uh, peptides to the forefront of uh, utilization uh, in, in, in informing uh, people about what's out there with some of these, uh, some of the peptides that are available, and and what we're going to bring to the discussion um, and application of of some of these peptides, and that's just running through these real quick: the TB500, the IGF1s, and IGF1 receptor grades, the mechanical growth factors, the peglated mechanical growth factors, the thymosin alpha one, which is a very interesting peptide for immune issues and uh, melanotan 1 and 2 and that aspect of uh, specifically uh, in the melacortin system with the brain. Um, I mean we got there's so many things we could talk about and spend a day on each one of these. Uh, PT-141 um, uh, and uh, yeah the GHKCU, the DSIP which is a, a deep sleep uh, peptide which uh, you can absolutely put people, uh, get them back, their, their stage four sleep. Um, fragment fragment uh, 17691, which is a fat loss fragment. It's a, it's a, that we, we've isolated off of actually gr the uh, growth hormone peptide itself and fragmented specifically the fat loss aspect of it. The N-acetyl C-max for the brain um, for increasing uh, uh, the uh, uh, brain neurotrophic growth factors and and uh, just as uh, cerebral lysin is another one of those and uh, selling for uh, anxiety issues and so forth and the epitalin and the thymolin and the TRH and the thibotropin and there's there are actually there's a whole other list that we haven't even gone through here too but just giving you some ideas of some things that we will spend in depth discussions on uh, bring you, I think, the latest discussions of research. Uh, Jim and I are very fortunate to to be in contact with with actually I, what I would consider some of the the, the world's leaders in in research uh, in these peptides around the world, and um, and we're on, I think we're on top of a lot of a lot of the things that are happening. So I've really discussed a lot of this really quickly. I hope I didn't confuse anybody. I hope I just kind of uh, maybe brought a little attention to a thought process and how we kind of look at it and and why its importance is uh, I think critical and and I believe it's going to I think peptides are going to be the future of medicine there's no doubt about it they're physiologic signaling agents that are utilized they're safe um, they're they're amino acid complexes and um, it's where I think you'll see all you you're you're seeing it now. You're seeing all these far, uh, compounding pharmacies and pharmaceuticals that are they're they're going. That's where the research is going. That's where you where you're seeing uh, you know a lot of these uh, uh, newer uh, medications that are coming out are actually peptides. So I, I think it's great that uh, we're able to talk about it, and hopefully I can intrigue you enough. Um, to uh, continue to uh, look into this and, and how it may change what you're able to do in, in taking care of your patients. Jim? Yeah, and Bill, I thought, yeah, I mean, a couple things. One is, uh, and guys, I, I mean, I want to stay tight on this so that we're done in an hour. So the first thing is, is, you know, we'll go over how do you measure redox potential. And there's some obvious things like understanding urine and salivary pH is a measure of redox. I'm looking at, you know, lab markers like adiponectin, uh, like, uh, GGT like VEGF uh, so that you know you have an idea of as you're doing work with people on peptides and you have certain metabolic targets you're trying to get them aligned in when you're looking at both their diet what nutrients you're going to give them what peptides they're on you want to see those markers shift because that's a sign that you're reducing the damage at a cellular level in that individual and, they're, and, and you're going to see it when they come back um, right. So that's one step is understanding that, you know, measurement, apply, look at the clinical results. I know that's how we're all trained, but I just want to reemphasize that you can do that and, and, uh, with peptides as part of your normal discipline and just know which markers to be looking for. We'll go through those. 
obviously, you know, looking at things like phosphatidic acid that, that you know, upregulates mTOR and improves, uh, you know, anabolism and muscle, uh, things like alpha-GPC and other phospholipids that will improve um, lipid membrane transport of information in the brain and in other tissues and for receptor signaling. We go through, um, you know, several, you know, nutrient, you know, combinations and novel ingredients that can really make a big difference on effectiveness. Um, one thing, Bill, I wanted to ask you, because I think it's something that's really important that maybe people don't understand. They think, oh, it's a peptide, it's okay. But in the bodybuilding world right now, there's a peptide that's being used, and you're like, hey, man, this thing is bad news. We need to be able to have that mechanism to get edge, you know, good information out and education out on which which uh, peptides are being used that may be being used in a misguided way, because we know that happens. Because right now, a lot of people can get them without any license, right? They're just out there getting them rogue, and we right. really need to be that source of information. So, if, you know, right. I, I thought that was big that that right. you know. Right. You know, you were, we were discussing that, you know, actually with a, you know, with a coach because it brought up. So anyway, we want right. to comment a little bit about on that. And then I'm going to give a little color to a case. You and I can discuss it and we'll get out of here directly on an hour so people can get on to their evening. Right. So, at, you know, so for example, on the, on the bodybuilding scene, what was going on with the peptides and what was affecting, probably affecting mood and behavior? Oh, you wanted me to talk about that a little bit. Okay, yeah. So yeah. I, you're referring I think it's, to I think it's uh, critical, man. I think it's absolutely critical. We understand that these kind of things are happening out there. That's why sure. it needs to be in our hands, doing sure. it the right way. So anyway, go sure. ahead. Sure. There, yeah. There, there's an oral peptide that uh, it's an actually it's a GHRP two or a GHRP type of peptide called MK six seven seven, and it's taken the bodybuilding world by I mean storm because it's an oral. It's not an injectable. It's something that everybody, you know, that they feel they can utilize, and they, you know, they, it does a GHRP2 by itself can have some significance in releasing growth hormone. Um, uh, the the downside of this peptide is it actually, it actually what it it's a longer acting. So the the beauty of peptides typically is that they're in and out, that you don't want them hanging out. Well, in, unfortunately, with this type of peptide, it has a very long half-life, and specifically in the brain, in the hypothalamus, the GHRP2, the GHRP receptor specifically, uh, if it's overstimulated, it involutes. And actually, with this MK677, uh, the research has, has just, just within the last few years, come out to show that the receptor, you, you burn it out, and what happens with that, it increases your fear and anxiety. And we kind of feel that this is where you see these stories about these people that, you know, unfortunately with, with some of these type of athletes, they're also doing steroids and all kinds of things that you, you hear these stories about these people going, you know, off, off the off charts and things happen and people getting depressed and suicides and things like that. Well, there's a re there there's a potentially a very significant reason for that and it's because you're you're burning out these receptors. Um and and that that that's a that's a significant understanding um that nobody really knows about and that they're just taking these these uh these peptides and they're they can be very dangerous in that fashion and and uh, that's unfortunate. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's what I think is as important as all the positive benefits that you're gonna that you're gonna learn. Um, obviously, we can't get everything about thirty different peptides in in a day, but we're gonna give you a really solid foundation, and then you know we're gonna plan on building um, the information from from here. Uh, we've got a very positive response that's gonna happen. But I'll tell you, there's one case that I know came up. Uh, Bill, that I, that, you know, I kind of brought you in on, and 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 you just, you know, were a wizard, helping to kind of get this gentleman to the next level. And and this is that classic example, you know, high allostatic load, very high functioning, former mayor of a city, CEO of a major corporation. I mean, a Fortune 50 company, uh, where he's, where I remember him telling me, yeah. I figure there's 5,000 meetings that have to occur before any project, 
And when he came to me, he said, you know, I'm only on meeting uh, 2,670, and I'm noticing now that I can't remember the facts that I used to be able to remember. Now, obviously, when somebody has that kind of memory, this is a mammoth individual, right? They're, they're planning cities. They're changing hundreds of thousands of lives. And yet what he noticed was his productivity was down. Now, here's the thing. If he was coming to us kind of, you know, unscathed, meaning he just came and said, I haven't done anything for my health. And now I'm feeling this way. But he was on growth hormone. He was on testosterone. Still was diabetic. His stress levels were high. His memory was, was uh, in trouble. Uh, sleep patterns were very disturbed. So we worked him up, and obviously you guys know I do a metabolic code report. I look at systems biology approach. Uh, lo and behold, triad one, adrenal thyroid pancreas comes up number one. He's under a lot of stress, making a ton of cortisols, melatonin suppressed at night. Thyroid was slightly low. Blood sugars are high. Uh, he had some food intolerances that were going on, so that was bleeding into gut immune brain, as you guys well know. Anytime the cortisol levels go up, you alter IL-6, IL-6 goes up, quad 2 goes up, quad 2 goes up, the gut gets leaky. Once the gut's leaky, you start reacting, right? So, uh, and while that's occurring, all the, uh, uh, this other dysfunction starts to occur. Yeah, I had a minor heart attack, uh, my mom blood pressure meds. So he was that classic 64-year-old uh big executive doing big things in the world, but literally it was that start. It's the, it's the term I like to use a lot. It's the, the saying I like to use, bright stars burn fast. If you don't understand how to control the rate of burn on your oxidative stress in your career, and I mean that, like how much you burn yourself out, you're literally burning yourself out at the cellular level. We uh, got him implemented on some, uh, you know, obviously on restructuring his day cycle and night cycle, his diurnal patterning of cortisol. Got him changing his diet. Got him on stuff for blood sugar regulation. Got it, you know, actually got him to do some things for his lipids because he was getting some myopathy from his high dose statin therapy. He was on. Uh, we actually switched him to a sub Q testosterone and got by on modulating his testosterone way farther down in terms of his dosing. But then came Dr. Seeds and us starting to incorporate the peptides into this gentleman's approach. And I, I know, Bill, that I know for a fact he was doing really well and he was on his way to recovery, but it seemed like when we added the peptides in, then all of a sudden things started to really change for him for the better. So maybe you want to add a little bit of color to this uh, situation, but that's more, you know, that, that's kind of what where I see this is that depending on how old a person is or how damaged they are in terms of their, their enzyme pathways and how much they reallocated their growth hormone, uh, releasing hormone receptors. And, and, you know, you reallocate your receptors, you know, they get suppressed into the cell membrane as you age, they, they, they don't get stimulated, they're recalcitrant, and, and you either have to stimulate them or not. And as you get older, that process becomes more and more recalcitrant, and, and, and now these enzymes don't want to work. Uh, and so anyway, Bill, I know, I know um, you had done a few key things with them. Um, your, your opinion on this case. Yeah, I I agree exactly everything you said, and 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 you know I looked at it from the the cellular level at hey look at what this guy's done like his mitochondria they're spent and and in fact you know he had that classic talk about yeah I started my growth hormone I felt really good at the beginning and then I lost it right and same with same with my testosterone I you know I felt great yeah. and then it, it went away well. He was just, you know, it can have an initial effect, but then the process, you, you know, all you're doing is feeding the fire. And and so once he accepted, you know, I think the harder thing for you, and, and I got to give you a lot of credit, was getting him off of that. And, <laughs> that yeah, right? wasn't easy. And, <laughs> right. Yeah. And, you know, and, and especially when, you know, everybody thinks more is better, more is better. And then when you're telling him, well, this is what we're going to do, it took, you know, it, he, he he understood it, and I think once he understood what the process was, he really was he he really understood that okay, let's take the step and let's see what happens. And and what I thought was just phenomenal, what you know, when the more patients that I've gotten involved with with Jim, 
is and, and Jim has really brought a, 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 a better appreciation of, of this for me is once you get these people if you can get them tuned to start with if you get there if you get some of this nutrient de depletions improved you get them on the right you know you get their magnesium up you get their pH balance you get you, you, you get them started in that stress improvement you get their cortisol a little better you know you're working on the, on the insulin resistance I mean then these peptides it's like incredible it really is an incredible thing to be part of but to see him change the way he changed uh, I thought was like I, I mean I always thought you know this guy he's overselling it and and but he kept you know it was it was a just to get him on level to him talking about his sleep talking about wanting to go to work get through his day and how his day he just looked forward to going to work and wow. how he could do things he couldn't do before you know, Absolutely. So here, here, yeah. here's here's the, where the rubber hits the road on it. He then started sleeping through the night, not waking up in the middle of the night to eat. He was able to be focused and concentrate and continue his other 2,500 meetings to change the city that he's in right now. He dropped 65 pounds. He was six foot eight, 420 pounds, and now he's down pressuring. He's going under uh, the the 360 mark at this point. Uh, his stamina is better. He's working out. So at 64, a guy 420 pounds at six foot eight wanting to go back in the gym, that's a feat in of itself. Um, and, and to your point, Bill, his, his enthusiasm came back to engage yeah. his, yeah. his career. And yeah. I think, um, I, I, and I, and I gotta tell you guys, uh, if, if you think that, and I'm, I am opinionated, I'm glad Bill said this because you got to learn how to balance somebody's nutrient needs out to get their base biochemistry to optimize these peptides. Yes, some people will feel benefit from peptides, but then I know if you guys are already using some Morlin, some of you go, oh, yeah, it went great, but this person's joints ache. Or this person, you know, they, they, yeah, they didn't feel good on it, right? They started getting headaches. If you balance out their chemistry, the likelihood of getting those kind of discrepancies goes way down. Because I haven't been seeing it happen that much because I talked to everybody before I initiated working on these things, and that's what their big complaints were. I just don't see it happen when you correct the chemistry. Uh, and so that's what this is going to be about, guys. Yeah, I, I mean, I think you're going to find an incredibly stimulating, fun uh, day uh, that's going to be, you know, drinking from the fire hose on information, but really getting some application. We know it already changed a lot of Doc's lives. We got a lot of, a lot of good, great calls from Doc's. Uh, and their patients. So I, I think that's about it. Bill, you got anything else to add? No, I, I, I just think also that there, there's probably, I, I hope also that people will realize that I think there's a lot of misconceptions of how to utilize these things also. And, and I think we might be able to dispel a lot of the, you know, the, the use of, of some of these things and why they don't work, you know, for people. But I, I do think, uh, I think on the other side of it also, as we'll show some cases that that's just as important um, in talking about this nutrient aspect, you know, some of these patients you can't get on that side of, hey, let's, let's start changing your diet, let's start doing this. Well, when you use something like this to get them on board, you know, to get them feeling better, get them started, right. it's amazing what they want to do after you get them after Absolutely. you get their attention, then, then, and, and you'll hear this uh, when uh, you'll hear this actually from one of our people that's going to come talk about their experience. Uh, that's how I get some of these people because I, I see more of the athlete first in their diets. Everything's a mess. Once you get them on board and they start, these changes are are that radical for them that they want to do everything, right, Jim? I mean, it, it's then the diet Absolutely. comes into play. Then. Then the stress relief, then the sleep, then the, it's like change everything because they only want to get better. That's right. Yeah. Great. Well, yeah. folks, I hope you in, enjoy your evening. Um, we're looking forward to the day. We think it's going to be a bunch of fun. We're, we're going to really uh, crank it up and, uh, you know, look forward to it. Absolutely. <clears throat> Are there any questions?
Well, thank you all for joining us tonight, and a special thanks to Dr. Seeds and Dr. Laval for providing us with an excellent preview of the Peptide Therapy Workshop. You may register for the pre-conference workshop by contacting an educational advisor at 561-997-0112 or visiting our conferences and educational events page at a4m.com. We at A4M slash MMI hope to see you there. Thank you, and have a good night, everyone. Thanks, Lindsay. Thanks, Jim. Okay, guys. Bye-bye. All right.